Hey everyone, this is Joe Foch at Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, Karen, Art, friends, family, so sad about Jeff. I, I'm glad that he is not uh, suffering. I remember Chuck would tell us, when your body becomes a prison, it's time to go. And I know he's not far ahead of us, uh, the way the world looks. But remembering him, uh, I think of many times sitting with him quietly. You know, he never needed to be the center of attention. He was always glad, and I was kind of like, in some ways, a second generation, a new guy. And uh, Jeff always took time to sit, to talk with me, to laugh. Uh, there was a warmth about the man that I will miss, even when uh, he would come back to the prayer house with us, just in the not too distant past. Uh, just sitting and laughing, and uh, he always had that laugh, and he, and he always was just willing to talk about whatever it was, just quietly. So a godly man, uh, an influence in my life. Uh, Kathy and I uh, love you, Karen, and uh, loved Jeff, that's for sure. Uh, going to miss him, I'm thankful the world is harking the return of our Savior so that we're going to see him in the not too distant future uh, together with Jeff. And uh, uh, sad, praying for you, obviously condolences, um, the church, you know, art, I know that there's a lot that falls on you and, and Karen probably more than anybody, but I uh, love you guys. So thankful I get to be some part of this. But when I think of the man, I think of a quiet, warm friend. He could laugh out loud, he could do something crazy, but whenever I just needed to talk, he was just willing to sit and laugh and listen. Um, remarkable, and I will miss him. God bless you guys. You know, when I think of Jeff Johnson, I remember as a younger pastor, getting a copy of that book, Harvest. And there were so many testimonies in there of the first generation of Calvary pastors. And as a young minister myself, I remember reading that and hearing their stories and reading Jeff's story and, and just being so inspired to want to emulate these men who had uh, blazed the trail um, early on in their walk with the Lord. And, and Jeff was such uh, an inspiration. And then also uh, reading his book about his testimony, just, it's just so powerful. And then getting to know Jeff was even more of a pleasure. A man who was, I, I would say, and I think most people would agree with me, filled with the Spirit. But not only filled with the Spirit, but he walked in the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, was evident in his life. And I so appreciated that about him. And it's been a privilege to know him and to really follow in his footsteps and continue to take this message of the gospel as Jeff did so faithfully, just teaching through the word so consistently. Um, I'm so grateful for him and just pray blessing over his family, over Karen, over the over the kids, over the grandkids, and just honored to have known uh, such a man of God. God bless you. Several weeks ago, I had the great honor and opportunity to participate in the Los Angeles Pastors Conference. I had a wonderful time with Pastor Art and the team at Calvary Chapel Downey. But while I was with you, it dawned on me again the amazing ways that God has used Pastor Jeff and Karen over the years. A large church that reaches thousands weekly and has a worldwide outreach. A school that provides kindergarten through high school discipleship for the church's children year after year. An adoption agency that rescues babies in hopeless situations and places them in loving homes. And that's just the beginning of a long list of ministries. But I also thought of how God used Pastor Jeff in my life. He was probably the first Calvary Chapel pastor I met whose name wasn't Chuck Smith. And I sensed in Jeff the same love for God's people and commitment to God's Word that I had seen in Pastor Chuck. Jeff encouraged me. 
It caused me to realize the Calvary Chapel distinctives could be carried on by other pastors and God could use me as well. Let me say to Jeff's family, thanks for sharing your dead with our Calvary Chapel family. And in the days to come, Karen, you and yours will be in our thoughts and prayers. The Taylor family is so grateful for the Johnson family, especially my pastor, Jeff. Miss him so much. Grateful that we were invited to Calvary Chapel Downey back in 1991, as lost as lost could be. And we're met with a fellowship family of loving people and a pastor that taught us the word verse by verse. And through the systematic teaching of the word, my life was forever changed, born again, uh, no looking back. You know, one of my favorite uh, passages that Pastor Jeff encouraged us to memorize is the first thing I ever memorized was Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Uh, it's in my heart. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart, not lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. So grateful that that's foundational uh, in my life. And then the saying, uh, when I was thinking of all the things that Pastor Jeff would say, uh, the saying that stuck with me is that God, even through this um, memorial, as we are celebrating the life of a faithful man, uh, this I'm reminded Pastor Jeff would always teach us that God is preparing us for what he has prepared for us. So thank you, Karen, family, and so appreciate Pastor Jeff. God bless you guys. Hey, I'm Brennan Beeler, pastor of Calvary Chapel here in Eagle, Idaho, but formerly the pastor of Regenerate Church in Huntington Beach. And I wanna say thank you on behalf of our entire ministry to the Johnson family specifically, and also to Calvary Chapel Downey for the lasting impact that Pastor Jeff has made in my life personally, and also in our ministries. Pastor Jeff has poured so much into my life personally, into our family, and into our church. And the work that God has called Pastor Jeff to is still being carried on through the life and work of ministries all around the world. Now we know where Pastor Jeff is at because he heard those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We know he finished his race strong. And so now he's left us with that commission to finish ours well and follow in his footsteps as he followed Christ. We wanna say thank you so much for the support and the love. And we love you guys. We love the Johnson family. We love Calvary Chapel Downey. Keep up the great work until we all meet together again in heaven. God bless. Hi, this is David Rosales. I'm the pastor of Calvary Chapel of the Chino Valley, as you can see from my, my sweatshirt. I wanted to take a moment to, uh, to say a couple of things about a man I loved very much, uh, Pastor Jeff Johnson. I first met Jeff uh, in the early 70s. My wife, Maria, and I had... Um, the opportunity to actually meet Karen and her daughters when they were very small um, many, many years ago. And eventually, Marie and I began to go to Calvary Chapel Downey for a little while. And um, as I used to tease Jeff, uh, he dedicated my, my daughter, Corinne, 40-some uh, years ago. And from there, I got involved a little bit with, with the church and got to know Jeff on a different level over time. And I have to say this, I have to say that my heart is so grieved over the loss, and it is a loss to me and to, the, to those who loved him, the loss of a dear friend and a man of God. Uh, Calvary Chapel Downey has been a beacon of light for so many years, over 50 years. And um, it's because God used this man, this man Jeff, and his, his sweet and beautiful wife, Karen, to do so many wonderful things. And and the body of Christ has suffered a, a real loss when, uh, when the Lord chose to take him home. And, and my heart is grieved uh, as I think about the fact that I won't see him on this side of heaven. Uh, and that's going to be for a little while. But until then, um, he'll always be within my heart and always be within my, my memory of somebody who, who loved Jesus very much. who was very much uh, very friendly and kind to me and uh, very welcoming to me as, as we grew uh, together in ministry and I grew to know him more and more over the years. And I, I, I will miss him and I do miss him. And um, 
I don't have many words to say beyond that other than uh, our hearts are with the church, our hearts are with Karen, the family, grandchildren and all, and and uh, I just wanted to say how much I love the man. And I just wanted to say how deeply he's impressed, impressed me and impacted me as a, as a minister. And uh, Karen, we love you, and we do pray for you. God bless you. Linda and I wanted to say first, we so wish we could have been there uh, to celebrate Jeff's life with all of you, but we were just unable to. So we wanted to do this little uh, video just to say how much we really care for you, Karen, and the family, and how much we loved Jeff. I was Jeff's first secretary. I had the biggest office. I was the sanctuary. And Karen, I believe I had your old desk. It was just so wonderful. Jeff loved the word and he loved the Lord. But I always remember when he was preparing his sermons, he always used red flare pens. <laughs> you know, Jeff allowed us to grow and to send us off, actually, when we moved to Colorado back in 1982, and really set us on a trajectory uh, of ministry for the rest of our lives. And uh, it was a great blessing just a couple years ago when Jeff invited me to come back and speak. Uh, and Linda and I got to be there with so many old friends and dear friends. And we are just so thankful for Jeff Johnson, our pastor and our friend, and, and we just, heaven is richer, though we are poorer. We love you, Karen. You know, Jeff used to always say, here, there, or in the air. Well, he's there. And so we will continue on and be faithful, like Jeff showed us how to be faithful. And we look forward to a great reunion. We love you guys. Uh, and so, we just, so very much. So much. And we just pray God's grace and God's comfort be with you all. Aloha, uh, Bill Stonebreaker, my wife, Danita, and uh, we can't be there for the memorial for Jeff, but boy, Jeff and Karen, some of our closest friends, and we just love those guys so much. And Jeff was my surf buddy when they came over here and we traded houses. Uh, one time, but when they were over here, we went surfing at just a great spot that uh, Jeff would talk about a lot. But I remember um, that when I heard about uh, Jeff going home to be with the Lord, I was in my car listening to K-Light Radio, and when I got a phone call that said, you know, Jeff went home to be with the Lord, Jeff's program was on at that time. I was listening to Jeff when I heard that. So I thought, you know what, Jeff with the Lord in heaven, but Jeff still speaks here, uh, you know, in Hawaii and I'm sure around around the nation with his program. So, hey, we love you guys. I'm sorry we can't be there, but, uh, you know, it, it just is, uh, is sad in one sense, but it's a joy to know that uh, we have that living hope because Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. Hey, God bless you. We love you. And hun, you wanna say a couple words? Hi Karen. We don't we don't think we're gonna be able to make it, sadly enough, but um, we've been praying for you every day, every day I when I text you. So it's always good to hear your voice and uh, to know that the Lord's just watched over you and we've had good talks. So I know he's close with you. So we love you again absolutely love your family and what God's done with you and well, we pray about what he, how he's going to use you in the future and we're, we're absolutely assured that he's got good things for you so the Lord bless you and your family and the kids and the grandkids so love you a lot bye yeah we're actually at church right after service so just want to say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. My Father's house are many dwelling places, mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God has fulfilled his promise to Jeff. 
he's come for him, taken him home. We're going to miss him, but we look forward to meeting him in heaven when we go. Hey, God bless you. Love you. You know, many people already know this, but Pastor Jeff used to, on a regular basis, refer to me as his son in the faith and oftentimes would call me his Timothy. And there's a really interesting story that goes with this, and I think it's appropriate to share. You know, Pastor Jeff has been with me through a lot, and he's helped me through a lot, and has really been a part of so much of my life on every level uh, up until very recently, until the day that the Lord took him home. And I remember this one very specific time when my dad had gone to be with the Lord. It was at the memorial service. I had walked up to Pastor Jeff, uh, very broken and in a lot of pain, and I told Pastor Jeff, you know, I love you, and I hope you know how much you mean to me and how much of a father you are to me in many ways. And Pastor Jeff looked at me very, very intently, right in the eyes, and he had a moment where he just paused, and it, it was very clear that he was holding back very emotional response. And he said, listen, James, understand this. There's only two fathers in your life that have had a profound effect on you. Number one, your heavenly father. And number two, your earthly father. And he didn't say your earthly father. He said Sam, which of course is my earthly father. Because what he did for you was he raised you up in the ways of the Lord. And by the time I got you, you were easy. Here's a funny thing that this all speaks of. Pastor Jeff was such an example of Christ on so many levels. First of all, Jeff was never, ever, ever quick to give glory to himself or anybody else other than to the Lord, number one. And number two, one of the most powerful aspects of the life that I saw Pastor Jeff live centers around who Christ was. Christ did not go to the cross willingly. He went to the cross obediently, and that was the life that Pastor Jeff lived. He lived an obedient life. Very hard not to get emotional thinking about this, but I can guarantee you he heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I say that as well. Well done, good and faithful servant. Karen and all the children, I'm praying for you. You all know we're family. I care about you. And I know that the Lord will be with you as he is with all of us in this time. God bless you. I love you. And um, what a powerful thing to see what God has done. Millions and millions of people all over the world have been affected by this legacy and by this ministry and God is faithful, and as Pastor Jeff said, right, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Hi, Karen, and the whole family, and uh, listen, I just want you to know how blessed I have been throughout my life, my Christian life, uh, 35, over 35 years now, and what inspiration Jeff was for me, from my early days living in Newport Beach, early days of a believer, walking down the sand, listening to K-Wave, and being connected with the messages of Pastor Jeff, and what an inspiration he was for me uh, throughout the years, and then also being invited to speak at a prophecy conference several years ago by Pastor Jeff, how encouraging that was, and also being able to be side-by-side -side with him at David and Christie's wedding this past summer, and what a delight he has been for myself, for my life here, and also for my eternal life, the inspiration of him pouring into me, even though he didn't know it most of the time. And listen, what a blessing. I can't wait to be reunited with him. We're all going to be in heaven one day. Our citizenship is in heaven, and I praise God for that, where we will never be separated from our loved ones again in Christ Jesus. And by the way, it's Jeff who taught me that. God bless you. Hey everyone, Greg Laurie here with some words about my friend Jeff Johnson. A whole bunch of us went out and started our churches around the same time. Pastor Jeff, Raul Reese, myself, Mike McIntosh, and many others. And, uh, and today you're in that church that God led Jeff and his wife Karen to start, Calvary Chapel of Downey. You know, it's said of King David that when he died, he fell asleep and he served God in his generation. And the same can be said of Jeff. He served God in his generation and through his faithful teaching of the word of God and being a wonderful shepherd and pastor, thousands have been impacted by his ministry. He's going to be greatly missed. But I love that part of the verse that says David fell asleep. You know, for a believer, death is not the end. We go from this life to the next life. 
Jeff is very much alive, worshiping and serving the Lord. And for those of us who have put our faith in Christ, we will see him again. You know, Jeff was a uniter, not a divider. He was a bridge builder, not a bridge burner. Always trying to put people together and and to encourage people. And to me, of all the guys I knew from the early days of the Jesus movement, Jeff still was like that original guy. The last time I saw Pastor Jeff was when we showed the Jesus Revolution film at Calvary Chapel of Downey. As you know, this film is a story of the last great spiritual awakening in America. And it was a real joy to sit next to Jeff and talk about it a little bit as we watched it together. I'm going to really miss Jeff, but let me say that he did his job well. He started his spiritual race well, and he finished it well. That can't be said of everyone, of course. And he followed the advice of Paul to Timothy when he said, These things you should pass on to faithful men who will teach others to do them also. Jeff handed that baton on to Art, who is now the pastor there at Calvary Chapel of Downey. So to all of you, let me just say God bless you. And we thank the Lord for the life and ministry of Jeff Johnson. Lord, we pray for this day as we look to you, Father, the one that giveth life and the one that taketh life. Lord, we understand that one of these days, Lord, we're going to be in your presence, Lord. Lord, help us to live the life that you expect, Lord. As Pastor Jeff, Lord God, for so many years lived that life. His wife, his kids, Lord, and now his grandkids. And Lord, I thank you so much for everything you've done over the years. And Lord, the first time I met Jeff, Lord, Father, what a man, what a brother, Lord, what a pastor. And Lord, I thank you now for all these people that have come to hear, Father, your word, and to hear the testimonies of the different people, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I wanted to share just a couple of things that are important. The first time I met Jeff, I met him at the Shepherd School in Costa Mesa, the first Shepherd School. The Pastor Chuck, uh, there were seven of us, Jimmy Kevner, Jeff Johnson, Bill Stonebreaker, myself. And uh, it was just an experience to be able to meet Jeff and uh, all these guys that one day would have churches that the Lord had given to them. And then Jeff and I went to uh, Peru. And in Peru, we did a crusade and another crusade. One of the pastors in Peru today uh, not only have a church, but they got saved at the crusade. And then the Lord started saving all kinds of people. And I think that it was so cool not only to know Jeff, but his family. But the most important, the way God used Jeff. How is God using you? I think that's important. That is, each one of us come to that place as we come here this morning to pay not only respect, but I believe that it's also a time where God can speak to you. You have to have an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to each one of us individually. And I thank God for you being here. We want to continue for the rest of the day here to see what God intends to do. May the Lord bless you and keep you. God bless you. Dad, don't pray anymore. I guess he's finished talking to the Lord. Fold his hands, he'd bend his knees, head down to the floor. Dad, don't pray anymore. I remember times were bad. He thanked Jesus for everything he had. A sweet wife and three children, food upon our plate. Everything was right when he said grace. 
times we didn't get along I thought I was right and he was wrong But late at night I'd hear him get down on his knees Say a prayer for me Now don't pray anymore no, he's, he's talking to the Lord Fold his hands, he'd bend his knees Head down to the floor Dad, don't pray anymore Today we followed Dad down to church Heard the preacher preach God's word we sang his favorite hymn, Daddy didn't make a sound. This afternoon we laid him in the ground. Dad, don't pray anymore. I know he's up there talking to the Lord. He bent his hands, bent his knees, head down to the floor. Dad, don't pray anymore. Dad, don't pray anymore. I know your life at times is trouble. Only you know the pain you weren't afraid to preach against the devil you were no stranger to his name go rest high on that mountain Jeff your work on earth is done go to heaven shouting look for the father and the son oh how we cried the day you left us we stood around your church in grief. Wish I could see the angels' faces when you give all praise to the King. Go rest high on that mountain. Jeff, your work on earth is done. Go to heaven shouting, look for the Father and the Son. Go rest high on that mountain, Jeff, your work on earth is done. Go to heaven shouting. Look for the Father and the Son. Look for the Father and the Son. We we'll love you, Karen. God bless you. Thank you. persuade men. The reason I'm even here speaking this morning is I know that this is how it's going to come down because God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. This is his word to us. He's given us the truth that will set us free. And it's up to us whether we're going to embrace it or not. For those of us who have embraced it, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And Paul said, 
For me to depart is far better than to hang around with you guys. To go to heaven is better. Paul had a taste of it. He says it's better. So there's something good coming. And it's called heaven. And we've got a hope as Christians. And we can be say in confidence, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. And thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Though whatever this world dishes up, maybe it, it's suffering, it's sickness, it's, it's even death. He's going to be with me to the very end. And then I get my new body. everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us as we honor and celebrate the life and legacy of my Saba, Pastor Jeff Johnson. <clears throat> my name is Taryn Leonard, and I am one of nine of Saba's grandchildren. Uh, Saba is the Hebrew word for grandfather. Jeffrey William Johnson was born in Los Angeles at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital on April 16, 1948. He entered Heaven's Gates on February 13 at the age of 75 years old. His parents were Harold and Dorothy Johnson, who had four boys, Richard and Gary, who were born when they were in their 20s, and Jeff and Dan, who were born in their 40s. Between the boys, there were 10 grandchildren. Dan, Jeff's younger brother, is with us here today, and many of Jeff's nieces as well. Jeff and Dan were known throughout Downey for their outstanding surfing skills. <laughs> However, Jeff had always admitted that Dan was a much better surfer. <laughs> Jeff attended Roger Cassier Elementary School. When he was in fifth grade, he took hot dogs to school <laughs> and built a fire in the bushes to cook them. <laughs> The fire got out of control and burned down the kindergarten classroom. <laughs> when the firemen had asked him, why did you do that? He said, I was hungry. <laughs> Jeff attended North Junior High from seventh to ninth grade. He perfected having epileptic, epileptic seizures when confronted with conduct issues. <laughs> this so upset the teachers and the principal that they forgot to deal with why he did school and didn't do his homework. <laughs> his mom and dad sent him to go live with his brother Gary in ninth grade. Gary taught him how to shoot rifles at the barren Santa Ana Canyon. Jeff loved that year away. Back at Warren High School in Downey, he had new adventures. Although Jeff and Karen were strong friends through their schooling, they really never dated until Jeff graduated. The, six, the 60s were a dark time for Jeff. Surfing gave way to drugs. There was racial unrest in our country, assassinations of political figures and leaders, and of course, the Vietnam War. Jeff was very confused and went on a God search. The search began with a mix of his own ideas, Eastern religions, and drugs. His best friend called him one day and said, Jeff, God is in Hawaii. <laughs> he left the next day for a five-month God search on Oahu Island. After taking heavy doses of LSD, he got lost running naked in the jungle for three to four days. He was covered 
with bug bites and scratches, but somehow found his way back to his abandoned car. He came to the conclusion that he did not find God in Hawaii. <laughs> he made the decision to sell his surfboard and go back to Downey to marry Karen and have a normal life. They got a dog, a van, and Jeff got a job. They married in 1969, two broken teens. Karen equally hurting over her own bad choices. Jeff and Karen independently of each other lost two babies to adoption. Newly married, one day Jeff saw an ad in the magazine and ran out the door. He came home with a pipe and tobacco, two aprons and a broom for Karen. He thought, this is all part of the normal life. They both burst into tears and Jeff went back to drugs, this time opium. One night, it all changed. His drug dealer from India came over with no drugs and instead, he came with Jesus. <laughs> that night, in a church down the street, the pastor said, is there anybody here that wants to accept Jesus into their heart? Jeff looked at Karen and said, well, I've tried everything else. <laughs> I'm gonna try Jesus. That was February of 1970, and the rest, they say, is history. <laughs> Jeff and Karen stayed in their hometown Downey and had their two daughters, Christy and Tara. They started Calvary Chapel of Downey in 1973. Jeff was a faithful pastor he was faithful to his wife and to his family and his grandchildren. In 1985, they were reunited with their two lost sheep. <laughs> Jeffrey and Linda, who were given up to adoption, were back in their lives. Jeff and Karen, had nine grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Jeff was the founder and the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel Downey for over 50 years. <laughs> if you knew him, you knew that he loved the Lord, he loved his family, and he loved surfing. He loved to travel, most of all, to Israel with over 100 trips with the church, taking our graduating seniors from our school here to see the Holy Land. He was generous, kind-hearted, and when you spoke to him, his eyes never looked away from you. Even in a room full of people, you were the only one there. He had the true heart of a shepherd. Pastor Jeff, my Sava, you are truly now in the Holy Land. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't exactly. <laughs> Gosh. Thank you for coming today. I'm, I'm really so humbled and blessed. 
the last seven weeks have really been a journey for me. Um, nothing like I've ever known. I, well, I don't put, want it for any of you guys. It's been incredible. But God has been faithful. And in 20 days, we would have been married 55 years. Uh, that picture of Jeff on the surfboard, um, that was on his 40th birthday at Toda Santos. And my brother, Rusty, and his friends, and Robin, so blessed that you're here. My sister-in-law, she just lost my, my brother. We just lost my brother just, just a few years ago. But they, were, they, went to, they rented this island in Mexico, and that, that's on his 40th birthday uh, surfing at uh, Mexico. So what I've been holding on to is Psalms 59.9. Lord, you are my strength and my fortress in whom I can rely. No doubt I'm going to miss Jeff again till I see him again, but I have to tell you, I, I don't miss him being sick. Oh, he was so sick. And when he entered heaven, it just, it just stopped for him. Praise God. I heard a story about the entertainer Liza Minnelli, who was the daughter of Judy Garland, who played Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. And she was playing at a packed house at the Hollywood Palladium, and the people started screaming, encore, encore. And she said, I'd love to sing an encore. And they said, sing somewhere over the rainbow. And she got tears in her eyes, and she said, no, I can't sing that. That song has already been sung. And that's how I feel today. I feel so blessed that Jeff has been so honored by you, and we've had so much, we had so many things that we had gone through in the last 15 months, uh, the, the transition time, you sending texts, your phone calls, your letters, telling me stories of how Jeff, how Jeff meant to you and things that he had done for you. He was a very, very, very generous man. And I thank you so much, and I love you for all of your, your gifts. And I, I cut out your scriptures out of the cards and put them on, on my cabinets. But I wanted to share with you about my husband and how this boy that I knew and this girl that he knew, and we were pretty messed up in the 60s. They think it was a fun time. Let me tell you, it wasn't. Uh, we were pretty messed up. And when he came back from Hawaii, in fact, that picture is of a picture of the day he came home from Hawaii. And he came over to my house, and he looked at me, and he just said, he told me about what had happened over there, and it was, it was pretty horrendous. And he came up to me, and he said, you know, because we had been friends all through school, close friends. And he said, you know what? We should get married. And I said, oh, okay. And he goes, <laughs> in fact, he said, you know what? We're going to get married. So I went in the kitchen, and I said, Mom, Jeff wants to marry me. And my mom said, really? I knew then if she would have said no or anything else, I wouldn't have done it. But she was so happy. Jeff was the only boyfriend I ever had that she liked because he would come in the house with that big smile of his. So we're going to get married. We, well, listen, we didn't know what we were doing. We went to see the pastor at the United Methodist Church. I mean, the only church in town that would even talk to us. Uh, <laughs> Jeff looked like the Manson family. Um, and so we went in to talk to the pastor, and he started telling us about these vows. Now, now my parents were older when I was born, and I didn't go to a lot of weddings. In fact, I, I only knew weddings from TV. And uh, so these vows, and the pastor said, well, you say these vows to each other. And I go, okay, well, you know, what? And he said, well, you say, I will take you in sickness and in health, or health, richer or poor. Well, I had missionary uncle, and, and I thought, oh, my uncle Dwight was in India. He, he took poor and, and bad health. And so I told my mom, I said, Jeff and I are going to take richer and, and health. That's the ones that we want. And she, she looked at me and said, did you think this was a multiple choice question? 
And I said, well, yeah. Well, that's how prepared we were for marriage. So we, we started out. And, you know, Jeff came from a home that was, his mother would say, the house has to be tidy. And it was like, I came from a house, house that everybody worked and we were slingers. So um, at, at the time, uh, there was a show that we liked, uh, that I really liked, Mod Squad. And uh, Jeff would say, you can't watch Mod Squad until you do the dishes. And I said, well, <laughs> we only had like four dishes, four plates, and I don't know why I just didn't do them, but I think it was just that he was just telling me what to do. But he said, no dishes, no Mod Squad. So we had a little black and white TV, so I had to go in stomping like a fifth grader, doing the dishes and slinging them and throwing the rag. I missed half a mod squad most of the time. But um, that was Jeff, but he was still on a God search. Well, during that time, my uh, Jeff's brother, uh, Richard, was uh, into a guru-type guy called Roy Masters. And um, we would listen to these records of Roy Masters, you know, trying to find God. So he would, Jeff would play these records, and he would say, now, Karen, we have to meditate. And then you take your hand this way, and you look through your third eye. <laughs> I never saw anything out of my third eye. I, 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 I couldn't, I didn't know. I said, Jeff, you know, I... I just don't know. I, it doesn't work for me. Uh, but um, he just would. He just said, "Well, we would just do these things." And Jeff was constantly oming all the time. He would be om, om, meditating and oming, mostly in the corner of our house, and mostly unclothed. <laughs> the neighbor would come over. The neighbors would come over and say, "You got to. You're going to have to shut him up." Well, our, our neighbor, Roy, I think his name was Roy, he came over one day and he said, you, you've got to shut him up. And I said, why don't you go in there and tell him? <laughs> now, he's standing on his head, unclothed. <laughs> so he comes out and he goes, oh! <laughs> I said, I know. <laughs> so it, it was a visual and... But I just said, Jeff, you've got to be quiet. You're going to wake up the baby. And he's just oming so loud. And he would sincerely say, I have to find God. It was real for him. It wasn't fake. It was very, very real. He wanted to find God. Well, he found Jesus at that little church. But I had had enough. I had enough of all of his God searches. So I went home to my parents. I filed for divorce. We, I was messed up. I was broken. I had placed a baby for adoption. I had another baby. I had gotten married. Now I'm divorced. I'm not even, I just turned 19. I mean, we were, we were messed up. It's horrible to feel so old at 19. But Jeff was, something was different about Jeff. He had settled down. He was settling down. It wasn't so, he wasn't so driven. We started, actually, we started dating again for about eight months. And he, he said, do you think you want to try this again? What do, you, what do you think? He was going to Calvary Costa Mesa at the time. I was told that they had put something in the communion. <laughs> and that's why all these kids were thinking the same thoughts. It was some sort of mind control stuff. But, but I knew it was something about Jesus. But hey, I was raised in a church that... We believed in Jesus, but we were. I was taught, once you're saved, you're always saved, and that's it. You should not tell that to a 10-year-old girl. Because I took it as the big ticket at the circus to just sin as much as I wanted. It's meant to comfort you, but I took it the other way. But I knew it was something about Jesus. He had a peace in his life. So we started going to church. His mother joined us. And then, but Jeff was still a hippie, and he was living in a commune here in Downey, and he said, why don't we consider, when we get back together, that we'll go live in a Christian commune? Would you like to go visit one in Costa Mesa? And I said, sure. I always wonder if it was Gail and Steve Mays' uh, 
commune. I don't know. Could have been, Gail. I don't know. <laughs> but we go down there, and um, he said, yeah, just kind of look around. Talk to the folks, you know, the girls. So I went in the kitchen, and I said, hey, you know, we're thinking about, you know, joining the commune here. Could you tell me a little about, about what's going on? What, what do you guys do all day? They said, well, we get up at 5 o'clock in the morning every day. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. What else? Well, we make lunches for all the guys. Really? How many guys are there? Oh, about 30. Oh, that, that really sounds fun. Then we wash all their clothes, make, you know, make, get, start getting ready for dinner. We have Bible studies. But this was the clincher. We make yogurt. Really? You make yogurt? Yes, and we bake bread. And you do this all day? Yes, we make yogurt all day. I said, well, you know, you could go down to Vaughn's and get a tub <laughs> for about a buck. Day-old bread, 25 cents. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh, no. We bake our own bread. And I looked at Jeff and I said, <laughs> take me home. <laughs> but he, he said, okay, okay. I, I had been enlightened to the, uh, to the communal life, and I didn't want it. I said, listen, it's hard enough taking care of one man. I don't want to take care of 30. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we all had to watch each other's kids. I thought, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So, and, I, I, and by the way, I've never made yogurt. <laughs> so we rented a house in Downey, and about 10 or 11 months later, we had Tara. Now we have new house rules. And those were rules that we made together. And it was such a blessing. And um, we had so many things that we did together. And one of the things that we did when our church was very, very, very young is we started supporting uh, Israel. And I don't even know how we got on that, except Pastor Chuck must have put something in our hearts that we just said, we have to support Israel. And you know, we never miss one month in all those 55 years, 50 years. When Jeff and I were separated and we got back together, I remember this so well. I had a little Volkswagen and Jeff looked at me one day and he said, you know, I'm just so happy. I'm so happy that I know in my heart, I know in my heart, I know for a fact that you love me. And I said, you know, Jeff, there's no possible way that you could ever really know that I really love you. You can't, you might think I love you, but you're, how would you really, really know? He said, nope, I know. I said, how is it that you know? Convince me. And he said this, and I never forgot it. Karen, you left me. You divorced me. But you came back to me. Love is a choice. And you can't choose love. To, you can't choose to love someone unless you have the choice not to love them. And... He said, and you came back to me. You chose to love me. And that's when I finally realized for the very first time, that's why God created man with a free will. Because he wants us to choose to love him. He didn't program us to love him. He didn't program us to make us love him. He wants us to love him because he loved us. And I knew that Jeff loved me because if he loved the Lord so much, I knew when I laid my head on the pillow at night that if he loved the Lord more than me, he was always going to love me. And it wasn't because I did the dishes or didn't do the dishes <laughs> or any other crazy thing we went through. And we went through a lot of weird stuff. But like all marriages, we had our ups and downs. The life of a pastor is like the life of a doctor. Somebody calls a heart attack, a death an accident, a teen maybe that runs away, a suicide, sick babies, elderly folks that die. You have to go. They just, they're, it's like a doctor. If something happens, they have to go. I remember calling Kay one time and saying, Jeff's never home. He's just never, never home. And I thought she'd feel sorry for me. She goes, yeah, I know. It's going to get worse. <laughs> and I go, it is? She said, it's going to get worse. And you know what? That's, that's the life that they've chosen. 
and you're his wife and you need to support him that night. But we had great family nights and Jeff, well, boy, did we protect those nights. People would come to the door and just, we'd open the door that much. Family night, you can't come in. <laughs> Slam. And he protected our family nights. One night, Jeff jumped into our spa. It was Christmas Day, 2007. Our nephew had fallen into the water. The water was about 105 degrees. Jeff found him. He knew that he had been in the water a long time because the little tops of his tennis shoes were the only things that was floating on top of the water. We knew that he was probably gone. Jeff started C CPR, nothing worked. We tried and tried, he tried and tried, but Jared was gone. He had drowned in our spa on Christmas Day. We prayed and we prayed. Robin and I prayed, we prayed so much. At the hospital, God just answered our prayers and Jared just stood, raised up. He looked at his mom and he said, no. And we thought later, he must have saw heaven and came back and saw us and went, no. <laughs> but he was back and it was a miracle. And that child didn't lose one dendrite. It was in all the Orange County newspapers, and they came to interview us, and it was such a miracle. Jeff and I were friends before we were married. We were very broken, and we were very different. He was mustard, and I was mayonnaise, that's for sure. He was sauerkraut, and I hate the smell of vinegar. But look what God's done at Calvary Chapel Downey. And you know it's the Lord, because if you knew us, really knew us, you'd go, no, 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 it, could, it couldn't be anything that they did, because it, it couldn't have been anything that we did. It was what God did through us. All the outreaches, everything that, everything that we've gone through, all the trips we've been to, missions, outreaches. So many of you have asked me, I'll end with this, so many of you have asked me, Karen, is there anything that I can do for you? Is there anything? And yes, there is, there is something that every single one of you can do for me. And that is, don't forget about me. Don't forget about the widows in your neighborhood. Don't forget about the widows. I, I want your Christmas cards this year. I want you guys to take me out to lunch in six months. I want to swim in your swimming pools if you have one. I, well, that's, I really, that's the truth. Don't forget. Don't forget about the widows and the orphans. And that's why we have Hannah's helpers here, all of our kids that are in the foster program. We're still doing what God's called us to do. All four of my children are here today, our children. We've lost Jeff, but I want to thank you again for your outreach to us. It's been such a blessing. This is my grandson, Jason. This is Linda's. And it's been such an amazing, powerful, sweet journey, but it has been sad. And I just want to thank you all so much for everything you've done. And well, I do have to add one more thing before we, I step down. Um, Taryn, the eulogy was incorrect. We don't have three great-grandchildren. We have four. And this baby was conceived in the hospital nine weeks ago when Jeff passed away. And one of the last things that Jeff said... Not in the hospital. <laughs> well, 
That would have that would have made it much more interesting, Jason. <laughs> Conceived when he, he, Jeff was in the hospital at, at their house. But anyway, Jeff, in his semi-conscious place, actually called out Shaley's name. And I really feel like that uh, he just asked permission of the Lord to say, hey, you know, we got to send, we got to send a baby down there right away. And that baby just popped up at, at their house. And, and, uh, but you talk about the circle of life. You talk about the, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And so we're going to have a baby in November. So thank you so much. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts all out all fear. I stand here today because my dad taught me and he showed me my whole life where that perfect love comes from. My dad played three major roles in my life. He was a dad to me, my sisters, Jeffrey, and I know he was a father figure to many. He was my boss as he was for hundreds, and he was my pastor as he was for thousands. And I'm sure many of the things that you will hear today, you will share with our family in Koinia because my dad loved people and he loved God. And together, we share beautiful, painful, sweet, golden memories. To God be the glory for every precious moment. 
My dad was like Moses, leading and teaching generations of people out of Egypt and into the promised land. He was outspoken like Paul, always preaching the gospel everywhere he went. And he was like Elijah, faithful to the end, and allowed by God to watch his mantle be passed on to another. My dad was funny, he was consistent, and he was the meaning of steadfast. And my dad loved food, <laughs> all kinds and always. He loved cooking with my mom at home, at the river, at the beach house. My favorites were his chorizo burritos and his famous saba spaghetti. I have countless memories of my dad reading his Bible on the dining room table, his office, airplanes, hotels, vacations. He was always reading and always learning. His dedication to the Bible was simple. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. He loved giving God's word on this stage, and he loved receiving God's word in the back pew. It was a priceless gift to sit in this church as a family and rest and receive. As a little girl, I remember my dad always talking about Jesus, heaven, hell, angels, demons. Everything was spiritual. And Monday night was our family night where we would play board games and go out to dinner to Marmax or Chris and Pitts. And we, was, we would always end our night watching Little House on the Prairie. As a teenager, we had many concert nights here in the Old Main. Daniel Amos, Keith Green, Striper, Isaac Airfreight. We had such, such fun times. And during the famine in the 80s, my dad took me to Ethiopia, where I was the youngest missionary in the feeding camps. And it changed my life to see so much starvation. As an adult, my dad became my boss. And we had Thursday lunches, Thursday meetings, walkthroughs, devotions. I remember I would be in my classroom and I would often hear my dad whistling and humming through the hallway. When our hope of him coming home turned into the reality of him going to his eternal home, I could hear my dad's voice saying, turn in your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter eight, verse 28, where the apostle Paul says, and we know all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And then he would say, and you know, all in the Greek means all. <laughs> all means all. He left us with a rich verse by verse chapter inheritance of sound doctrine. The baton has been passed down to all of us to have an uncompromising biblical worldview, to tell others about Jesus and to tell people that he is coming soon and very soon. He taught us to love Israel and God's chosen people, and he lived in constant revival mode even until the end. We will always be the Eyes on Him family. Dad, we will see you there or in the air. We all dreaded waking up this morning because today was the day. But interesting, when I woke up, Dad was singing to me, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Linda, and as Taryn shared, I came into the Johnson family as a teenager nearly 40 years ago. <laughs> but interesting enough, I had heard Jeff for nearly two years before we met. I'd come home from high school in the afternoon and my mom would be listening to Sound Doctrine broadcast on KBRT. Growing up in a devout Baptist home, my mom had to listen, I'm, I'm sorry, for my mom to listen to anyone other than J. Vernon McGee. <laughs> he had to be a great Bible teacher and Pastor Jeff was. I'd be eating my lunch at the kitchen table the word being delivered in ways I had never heard before. Someone sharing stories about life, family, interesting enough, my family, God's love, a teaching style patterned 
from another great storyteller we all know, Jesus. As I was welcomed into the family, I watched Jeff as a father taking Christy on precious dates. I remember him giving her some special earrings she cherished. Escorting Tara at her homecoming. One of the pictures was of that day. Driving her around the track in the convertible, beaming with pride, always encouraging, supporting, challenging them. And I admired and loved their respect for him. I loved the way he led the family with love and generosity and the life he brought into the home. He was always so happy. That smile, that man could not take a bad picture. Well, Jeff soon became my dad, not a stepfather, my bonus dad. He sent flowers to my work to celebrate my birthday and bought me a beautiful ring on a trip to Israel. I loved riding bikes to the beach with him and talking on the sand, having deep conversations about relationships, life choices, and his path to the Lord through his own life struggles and searching. He loved to cook us breakfast. Some of our best moments and memories are in that kitchen and around the dining room table. I watched dad as a pastor. He was old school. He had his handwritten red pen notes so dedicated to the word, pouring over the Bible, listening to Pastor Chuck's commentaries, faithfully studying for hours, even days to develop his messages. He became my pastor, and I learned to see the Bible as the great handbook of life to guide me through my own. A great adventure story that I could join and write my own chapter, and honestly, it's been difficult to find the quality of Bible teaching that he gave. I loved calling him my personal Bible answer man. Dad always had the perfect scripture for whatever situation I brought him. He baptized me as a teenager down at Pirate's Cove. My husband and I were blessed to be baptized by him in the Jordan a few years ago. Dad performed Will and I, our wedding, 10 years ago. And over the years, he blessed us with the loving support and so many incredible memories filled with intelligent conversations and laughter. I'll never forget them snoozing on the couch at a family vacation to the beach. So much for intelligent conversation. <laughs> they both said, well, you know, we're guys, so. Dad was always praying over us, encouraging us, blessing us. Seven years ago, my own dad passed away. And Jeff officiated the service. It's very surreal for me. Afterwards, he came to me and he looked me in the eye and asked me, if it's okay with you, I'll be your dad now. And from that day on, our dynamic changed deeper, stronger, a better understanding of each other, a new respect, a new bond. The last few years have been difficult to witness, but despite his illness, his weakness, he came alive when he dedicated our Amelia Blue. When he learned of the coming of our Malachi, it gave him a shot of strength and hope during those wretched days of chemotherapy. The light in his eyes and that megawatt smile returned when he held our Wade for the first time. And his mom shared the power in his voice when he called out Shaley's name in their last conversation. It was almost as if he was calling life into her womb. So it would always remind us 
of Proverbs 17. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. And as you'll hear and see in a few moments, his life mattered and his love and legacy continues on through them. This picture is our last Christmas together. Just a few short months ago, this was a rare day as all of the family, kids, grandkids, great grandkids, we were all there together. And he shared with us as he's holding Wade there, this is what it's all about, family. He brought us together. His love and prayers for all of us brought us together. And I am so incredibly proud of how our family has united over these years of never ending doctors, procedures, treatments, all that goes into caring for one who is so dreadfully ill. Our dad, our Saba, his life ended with the sweet voices of Tara and Taryn singing worship to him the loving and devout care given by Natalie, the scheduling, the meal preps, the walks, David and Christy sharing Super Bowl Sunday with him, <laughs> Justin and Laura reading the word to him, the joy of life brought into the home by Abby and Amelia's visits, Emily driving down to love on him and share videos of Wade laughing and walking, spaghetti all over his face, FaceTime conversations with Andrew and Aaron in the military, Annie with her international travels, Jason and Shaylee with their adventure stories, and of course our mom. His love, his faithful bride by his side, through the sickness, providing words of comfort and a sweet memory lane as he walked through the valley of the shadows of death. I was honored to have my hand on his chest to feel that last heartbeat, close enough to feel that last breath, to watch his spirit fly away, to see his closest friend, the one who called his name to live in eternity with no more sorrow and no more pain. Dad truly loved the Lord. He is my pastor, my dad, my friend. From an old song, one you may know, whose lyric is woven through all of our lives here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Good morning, everyone. I just looked at the time. It's still morning. <laughs> uh, Karen, Christy, Tara, Linda, your partners, extended family, all the children, the grandchildren, my heart is with you. And I want to thank all of you today for coming to remember Jeff. Most of you know who I am. Some of you are probably like, who is this guy? <laughs> well, my name is Jeffrey, and I'm Jeff was my biological father. My biological mother, Debbie, named me Jeffrey Brian Johnson. I saw the birth certificate. Uh, and my adopted parents already had the name Jeffrey as an option, so they just stuck with it. <laughs> Always knowing that I was adopted, I had a 
a deep yearning to know who, when, why, where. In 1985, <laughs> Jeff contacted my folks, and when they told me Jeff wanted to meet me, I said, let's do this. I was really excited, but nervous and anxious. Meeting Jeff and Karen that first time, I finally got to look at this man that resembled me. And all I could think was, this is so bizarre. <laughs> Jeff told me that day that he wanted to get to know me and be in my life. And this touched me in my heart so deeply. He then went on to share that he was a pastor at Calvary Chapel Downey <laughs> and handed me a gold Star of David pendant that he had gotten in Israel. I thanked him and said, you know, Jeff, I am Jewish. My last name is Rosen. He said, we love the Jews. <laughs> right? Can you just imagine him saying Wow. <laughs> uh, lo and behold, our wonderful relationship began. As I got to know Jeff, I found this charismatic man, a compassionate listener with a soothing voice that loved his family. He loved his faith. He loved his work leading the fellowship here. He adored his visits to Israel, as we all know. I stole this from you, Taryn. I'm just giving you your speech now. And of course, surfing. <laughs> he invited me to join the Calvary Tour twice to Israel, which I gratefully accepted, and I will remember those tours fondly. I need to get off my speech for a minute. I had a memory while I was, Linda was offering her remembrance of Jeff. Uh, when my father passed, who uh, raised me, uh, we had a, a Jewish funeral and we were at the cemetery and Karen and Jeff both came to that ceremony. And there's a ritual in that ceremony where uh, toward the end you line up to administer with a shovel dirt onto the coffin. And guess who was the last one in line? It was Jeff. And that was incredible. It's like, I was like, how does this happen? My dad that raised me is leaving, and my dad that I now am getting to know is here to offer solace and, and, and hope. I will never forget the image of Jeff wearing his board shorts and his Ugg boots, <laughs> riding his cruiser down to the beach to check out the waves. It's just a thing I have in my mind. <laughs> and as we all know, he loved food, but his spicy food specifically, right? I, I mean, he believed jalapenos went with everything. I think he carried some in his pocket at all times. <laughs> oh, and as we all know, he loved the healing power of laughter. And I will miss laughing with you, Dad. My final visit with Jeff was in sept last September, at which time he told me, when the time comes to leave, I am ready. But for now, I'm going to keep on fighting. What an honor and a privilege to have had this man in all of our lives. <laughs> Jeff, you will always be loved and you will be so deeply missed. And as it says on the inside of the ring, this fellowship gifted him for 50 years of ministry, steady on. We will steady on with you, Jeff, 
in our hearts. L'chaim, thank you. Wow. How does one write how amazing their dad was in just a few minutes? <clears throat> I'm Tara, I'm the youngest. And as my mom shared, just, it doesn't take long to see the fruit of my dad's life. You can just look around. So many lives affected by his love for the Lord. But we, again, with my mom, we just want to thank you guys so much for your prayers and cards because during that two weeks that my dad was hospitalized, it was very, very hard. And we were told when he first was in the hospital that the emergency surgery would not go well. So we rallied together as a family and we actually had to say our goodbyes at that moment in the emergency room. So we prayed and um, as they wheeled him away, the Lord just gave me a picture of my dad running his last leg of the race to the finish, finish line ribbon. And I just saw him just running, running, running so hard. And I heard the Lord whisper to me and say, will you not celebrate him finishing Tara? I thought, well, of course, Lord, I would. Why would I not celebrate my dad finishing the race that he so faithful, faithfully ran? Why would I not cheer him on to the finish line? And that brought so much comfort to me because this was something that he had preached about day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Why would I not celebrate him just touching that ribbon and seeing the Lord. But my dad was never the same after that surgery. And honestly, he was never the same really after he stopped preaching. It was almost like preaching gave him life. I think it just bothered him so much that this body would not be able to be used of the Lord in the same way. And it was so weird to switch places with him and, and now remind him of everything that he would say to all of us. And I said, Dad, your spirit is so willing, but your flesh is weak. It's time to rest. It's time to, for you and the Lord to be together. The Lord is so jealous for you, Dad, that he's put you on your back. He wants you all to himself. Even the last few days before he passed, he was asking for his Bible and his notes, and he was hearing the rain, because it was raining during that time, and he was asking, who's on the roof? And if you know of that, it means that this place always kind of leaked during the rain. So he was, our, he was still caring about the church so much. <laughs> but again, your sweet cards and prayers got us through to prepare us to be able to let him go. And I am so blessed that I was able to spend the night that night before he passed. And I just sang to him all night. Mom and dad, thank you for giving me Jesus. Father, this is the song of my heart. All the songs. But my first memories of my dad was him waking up in the dark. He would go to his job. I think it was, gosh, I, I just remember this. It just came to my mind when we were doing, doing this that he would, I remember him waking up at dark and he would go to his welding job. And every time he would come home, we, we'd take off his boots, me and my sister. Just remember those big work boots. And I remember when I was five, he had this big comic book of the, of the Bible. And he showed me the part where it was Noah's Ark and, and, and the story of the wicked days of Noah and that everybody was warned and, and, and only Noah and his family got on the ark and there was people scratching and begging to get on, but the door had closed. And even at five, I understood 
I don't want to be left behind. And I remember saying the sinner's prayer with my dad. I guess my name went from holy terror to holy Tara because I guess I was a bad little kid. I don't know. But I got saved at five, so I was good. I guess I changed. <laughs> Mom, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I can also still smell the leather Bible that he'd carry after church and just kind of hanging out with him as a little girl. And um, I just remember, you know, him talking to everybody and praying with everybody and him saying, praise the Lord and hey, brother, hey, sister. But little did you know, that's probably because he forgot your name. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Dad. Gave him your... And you pastors know. I know you know. <laughs> it's okay. But I loved waiting for him after the service here at Downey. You know, what he would do is he would walk up after the service. And I always loved to be in the back when they opened the doors. And I'd always be like, hey, you know, it's me. I'm the, the first one he got to see when those doors opened. I just felt so special. He prayed with us every night when we were little. And I never feared him dying because I thought, he's too important. <laughs> like, it, he's too important, Lord. You're, you're never going to take him, you're never going to bring him home anytime soon because he's way too important. And then all the memories of catching lizards and fishing. And we would pull weeds together in the backyard. And he would always say, Tara, you got to dig down deep because... If you don't pull from the root, it's going to come back. And he was, of course, talking about sin. Weeds are like sin. But during the 80s, as Christy said, we would watch Little House on the Prairie. And growing up at this church, I felt like a little Ingalls girl who lived on a farm and community like Walnut Grove with my strong pa who worked hard and was always helping people in our little town of Calvary Chapel Downey. It felt like a little taste of heaven where we went to church school and we had beautiful lives. It was a wonderful upbringing. And as I grew, the church grew from the little park at Furman Park, I think I was four, to what God was, has done. It's amazing to have watched. And then, yes, praise the Lord. Just thankful that he took us along to do mission trips. He loved missions. He always wanted you guys to be a part of missions and that experience of knowing the Lord and sharing it. You, everyone has something to give. Everyone has something to share. And we were able to travel with him. And I, was, I would sing it with him when he would do pastor's conferences. We went to Egypt and we got to go to Peru and do this huge concert and so blessed with Russia. And I know those of you who are here uh, and for missionaries, understand that support that he gave. He loved to share his testimony. And of course, we got to travel to Israel almost every year as a child. It was kind of like we knew it better than our, the streets of Downey. <clears throat> but even as, even as a young adult, I remember, I never really don't remember my dad yelling or freaking out. When a moment would be scary or difficult, he would always tell us to pray and he would not react. My dad was very good at letting Jesus take the wheel, that's for sure. He brought so much peace in our lives. And I'm so thankful that my husband, Yuri, and my kids got to grow up here when they were little. But I have to say it was not without trials and warfare. The enemy, the enemy would come in hard at times, breaking the family apart and causing a sword and separating us. And looking back, those bullets of the enemy were directed to my dad and to really end the ministry. And it seemed like anyone that worked close with him, you know, his assistant pastors were direct targets. And you know too well that you carry some scars and you got the bullet wounds and I thank you for protecting my dad. And I also want to thank all of his secretaries. <laughs> my dad was very particular, and he loved his ice co diet iced coffee from McDonald's with two squirts of vanilla. I know you know what I mean. 
but thank you. And I can't help but also thank all the pastors that worked with him from the beginning, so many that worked with my dad. You who took that, that vision started those small, as the small ministries, as my dad would say, this is a big church, but you're gonna find the smallness of it when you go into the smaller ministries. You supported my dad's vision. Also wanna thank our maintenance guys, all those walkthroughs and picking up trash when my dad would walk with you. And he just, he really took pride in this place. And yes, the ushers for giving him breath mints before he would see y'all, okay? <laughs> Thank you to the ushers that would stand with him. And then to the teachers and Sunday school teachers to raise our little ones. Thank you. He would, he would want me to tell you that. But my dad believed that restoration was the second greatest work of the Lord besides salvation. And in the last, these last seven years were so full of forgiveness and lots of love in the family. Just so thankful that God restores what the enemy meant for evil. He restores with babies, with, with ministries, adoption ministries, so much from what Satan meant for evil. I'm here to tell you, God is gonna use it in your life for good. But my sweetest memory of my dad was when I would lead worship right here. And I would get to see his hands gripping this pulpit. And he would share again, week after week, year after year, the salvation message with such passion as if it was the first time I just felt so honored to be able to watch and know him, of course, so close. But I, I have to admit, I was so happy that we had him all to ourselves these last few years. It's, it's, it, it was rough sometimes, but I know that all of us that maybe have maybe have gone through stuff because of ministry, there is a special treasure in heaven. And I know our family has some treasures. <laughs> I know my dad loved this scripture in Hebrews 12, but first of all, in Hebrews 11, I really believe that if the Bible was written today, my dad would be in the hall of faith. It says, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord that since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and this is my dad, since my dad was surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he threw off everything that would hinder or easily entangle. He ran the race with perseverance, the race marked out and fixing his eyes on Jesus. Yes, and we love eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And this is the portion where we need to pay attention when we go through stuff. Because this says, for the joy set before the Lord, he endured the cross. He has endured first. He knows. And that's why he shares this portion. Yes, it's so awesome that we can be who we are in Christ and live a wonderful life. But I know my dad will want this message to go out that the Lord understands and took it first. And that he's saying, do not grow weary or lose heart. We can't grow weary even when we lose those that we love. If they know the Lord, we have to cheer them on. And my dad loved this scripture as well. Um, Behold how good, well, and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together, but also this scripture, and it's now blanking my mind, but it's, it's, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. And during that time, we had to be thankful 
for my dad entering into eternity. And I don't want us to be sad. I just want us to all to know that we're going to see him soon. This is a little gift from our family, is the bookmark, just to put in your Bible. And one of my dad's favorite scriptures, and you guys can read it, but the Lord is going to give us that peace and to not be afraid. And we're just so blessed to have this place so full of so many people's lives that were touched by my dad. Thank you so much. to follow after what he is doing. You know, I was thinking about this, that my kids, that my grandkids could follow me. That they would see in me that I love the Lord, my commitment to the Lord, my example, not being uptight all the time, lacking trust and faith in God, being all stressed out in front of them, you know? No, no, no. But as Demetrius, we're not even told what Demetrius did, but we do know this, that he followed God's truth and he was a man of God with, with a good report. May my kids, my grandkids, see their Saba, see their father, in that way, that I'm not freaking out, that I'm keeping my eyes upon the Lord, and they can look to me to follow, because I'm following Jesus. Some of my early favorite memories of Saba was going on fishing trips with him, and I used to love staying with Mimi and Saba after church, and uh, we'd always stop at Wiener Schnitzel, and he was the one that introduced me to a chili dog. He would always get himself a Polish hot dog, and fast forward into the future, he was the one to officiate the wedding for Shaylee and I, and that's just a great memory that we will always be able to remember forever. The first memory I have of Saba is when I was a little girl. He would pick me up and put me on the back of his bike and we would ride down to the Seal Beach Pier and he would play with me on the playground. I can remember sleeping between Mimi and Saba and right before we would all fall asleep, Saba would turn over on his side. And the last thing I remember seeing before I closed my eyes was all of his back hair. I remember all the good times we had together in the spa. He would put us on his shoulders and dive down deep under the water. And I'll never forget that gold chain camel that he would wear every single day. One of my favorite memories is Saba taking me to the car wash or our car wash adventures, or as how he would say it, let's go get the car washed. <laughs> I'm forever grateful for that last year we got with Saba. Not only was I able to be married by him, but he was able to meet my son Malachi, who he loved very much. He was able to build a relationship with him, he dedicated him, and he was able to be at his first birthday. I'm most thankful for the lessons he taught me how to truly love the Lord. Thank you, Saba. I'll always miss you. Love, your Laura Menorah. Anytime I would walk in through the door, I could always count on Saba to greet me with a hug and call me Auntie M. If I needed someone to talk to or prayer, he was there for me with anything I needed. I'm so grateful that he got to meet my son Wade and Wade loved Saba. Saba would make all these duck noises and Wade would laugh. We love you Saba and we miss you. I have so many precious memories with Saba. It's nearly impossible for me to try and pick just one. A special few that come to mind are being baptized by Saba in the Jordan River taking him to buy flowers for Mimi, watching him sunbathe while listening to Marty Getz, and going to Disneyland on Saba's last birthday. 
When I asked him what he wanted and he said to go to Disneyland, my jaw just dropped. I'm so thankful that we made that happen. We've had countless beach trips, shopping outings, going out to eat, traveling, and more. We were and are very blessed to be able to do these things as a family. I'm truly thankful for these last few years of being able to help Mimi and Saba navigate through his health journey. It was quite the roller coaster we as a family rode together. Becoming his caregiver was unbelievably special. Our weekly walks and battles in the kitchen are missed dearly. I will cherish those moments and memories in my heart forever. When Saba first got sick, I was able to sit with him during chemo. I'll never forget how thankful he was. While he was sitting in that chair with his treatment going on in a place where someone might be questioning or angry with God, Saba was praising the Lord and preaching to his nurses. And this continued throughout his entire health journey. No matter what doctor's office appointment or hospital we were at, he was sharing the word of God. No matter what he was going through, Saba's mission was the same. He always had a smile on his face with his finger pointed up to the Lord. Well, Saba, I'll keep pointing up for you and to you. I'm so thankful Saba's legacy will live on not only through our family, but through Sound Doctrine, Gihon Springs, and Calvary Downey. Saba, I know you're up there riding the glass wave with Uncle Rusty. Your Leah loves you so much. We'll see you guys soon. My Saba was one of the happiest men I ever knew. He loved his God, his family, and his church. He taught me how to surf and got me into the whole surf and skate scene and wardrobe that I still wear to this day. One of my last memories of him was him showing uh, this little stool uh, that we painted together in his bathroom when I was a kid. He was very proud of that stool and I'll never forget the, uh, the look on his face when we were talking about it. I love you, Saba, and thank you for your love and wisdom. Generous, kind, filled with God's peace, disciplined, meek, good and faithful servant. These are a few words that come to mind when I think of Saba. Some of my favorite memories with him was simply soaking in the sunshine. He never wanted to wear sunscreen, even when the sun was blazing down on us. And if the sunscreen was over 15 SPF, forget it. He was not using it at all. Saba taught me that the world is not getting better, so we need to get brighter and wise in the things of God, and He's going to bring the blessing. Saba walked in the confidence of the Lord, even behind closed doors. I will always remember Him as a faithful steward and shepherd. He taught me that when I seek the Lord, He will always be there to give me that sweet, sweet shalom. I'm confident in this. Saba is in the presence of the Lord experiencing His agape love and that sweet shalom for eternity. I'm buckled up and ready to carry on His legacy. See you on the other side, Saba. Love you. My dear Saba, I'm gonna miss you so very much. I'm gonna miss your loud voice and your loud laugh and just being so silly all the time and just cracking jokes left and right. I think one of my favorite memories with you is just being able to drive down by the beach and watch the sunset and get a McDonald's coffee and just talk about life and how things are going. And I'm just so grateful that I got to see you become a great grandpa. I think that was just the most special experience that I got to have with you and watch you with Amelia and just be so kind and funny with your little Donald Duck voice. And I'm really gonna miss just having those beach days with you and getting to enjoy the sun and tan and making food. It's just, I know it's gonna be different, but I know that now you're surfing the waves up there. And my goal this year is to learn how to surf try to break in some of those surfboards again and I know Amelia misses you so much we love you so much I think my most favorite memory of Saba is 
just watching all the creations he would make as we were about to eat. He always had to add spice, sauces. Um, he was very sassy about his food, and it's something I'll always remember him about. Not only that, but just him being an amazing travel companion and someone who believed in me no matter what. And I know he's looking down on me right now, and I know he's proud, and I'm just happy that he's where he's meant to be, and I'm going to miss him. I love you, Saba. What's up, guys? I'm currently at the Spro Griffiths Tree for the Marines. Getting ready for a bait hike tomorrow, but before I went to bed, I just wanted to say a few words about my grandpa, Saba. Um, I don't know. I don't even know where to start. Honestly, he was such a cool, such a cool guy. I think one of my favorite memories was just I, before I left to come here, we went to the beach and just watched the waves. It's something really simple, but it's just like those times were so joyful and just. I miss him so much, but I know he's he's with God right now, so, you know, I know everything's going to be okay. All right. Love you, Saba. I am so grateful for the relationship I was able to have with Saba. I can remember meeting him for the first time when I was 14 years old, and right away, he treated me like I was family. I'll always remember the smiles on his face when we would stop in and say hi the times that me, him and Mimi would come and help us clean our house, or even just the man talks we would have. He was a true servant, and he embodied saying the truth in love. It brings tears to my eyes when I look back during his season of cancer and how excited he was that Laura and I were having a baby. He just said, I gotta get out of here, I gotta live. And he did just that. He loved my son, and my son sure loved him. He was able to marry Laura and I, the moment we shared our first communion is one of the most precious memories I have. I still can't believe he announced this as Mr. and Mrs. Chewbacca. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff Johnson. You will always be Miss, and I will always keep my eyes on him. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives who once was dead. He lives by ever. lives triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. He lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to lead lives and grants me daily breath. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives and while he lives I'll sing. He lives
comes my prophet, priest, and king. Hi, I'm Pastor Mike Sasso. Open. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Rome. No, I'm just kidding. That's what Jeff would do. And you know what? I'm not going to steal Jeff's thunder because if you wait, if you stick with us in a bit, we're going to watch and listen to Pastor Jeff preach the gospel before we leave. We've got a special clip for you. But listen, I just want to tell you something. You know, uh, Karen called me and says, Mike, we want someone to speak about Jeff as a pastor and friend. And he was. He was my pastor and my friend. I first met Jeff in 1972, before any of you were born. <laughs> I was a senior in high school, and the Jesus movement was in full swing. And all my friends, we'd drive down to Calvary Costa Mesa in the tent to, for the Maranatha concerts, and we are high on Jesus. We just were excited about the Lord. And then one day, Rumor had it that there was a Jesus People Bible study starting up in Downey. And uh, it was taught by a hippie gentleman, and we all start going to it. And one day, the, the, very soon after I started going, the teacher says, I've been mentoring a young man who uh, I believe is called to be a pastor, and I'm planting churches, so I'm not staying. I'm going to plant this church and move on. And he sent a young man to take over that study in Downey. It was at an old River School Road Assembly of God, which I don't think it's still there anymore. Uh, but uh, this man introduced the new teacher. It was young Jeff Johnson. And what, a, what an excited young man who loved the Lord. And would, after Jeff came, that study just took off. As a matter of fact, I, there's no time to explain all the different places we've, we've gone to and all the things we've done. But let me just quickly run through it. From, from that little back room of an Assembly of God church under Jeff Johnson. He wasn't a pastor yet. We went to Furman Park, and then not long after that, we moved to a little building on 4th Avenue, and quickly after that, we outgrew that and went to a building on Firestone behind Arby's, and not long after that, we started to meet in the Downey Civic Theater because our previous building was too small for us. And then we found this big piece of property, 13 acres on an old white front building, which you're looking at now has been converted to a church. It's amazing the journey that I've watched and kind of followed in the shadow of Pastor Jeff. I want to tell you a couple of amazing things about Pastor Jeff. If you really knew him well, he was not a businessman. He was a simple man who just believed the Lord and believed big things for God. And yet, he was able to do big things because the Lord always brought to him people who knew how to get things done. The Lord always put together a team. I was jealous because when I planted my church, I didn't get the team. He did. It was amazing. <laughs> Under this simple man of faith, Jeff Johnson, we saw building projects galore, schools of ministry, Calvary Christian School, which is going strong today, a Bible college, so many freedom celebrations, which we're celebrating on the 4th of July. I can tell you stories. No time. Je Karen told me I have five minutes. <laughs> but I'm going to take longer. 
huge evangelistic outreaches, one after another, alternative nights on Halloween, which we fill this place with amazing stories, Easter sunrise services at Cerritos College Stadium, on and on and on. But I want to tell you some winning characteristics uh, of Jeff. You probably already know this one. Jeff had fearless faith. I mean, he, he was never afraid to take big steps of faith following in the footsteps of his pastor, Chuck Smith. And besides purchasing this property, I watched him over the years take many, many huge ventures of faith, uh, great outreaches, mission trips, feats of faith, glorifying God. I know there's been on mission trips where his life was in danger. What time? I don't know the story. I wasn't there in this one, so I can't tell you the story. You're lucky. And he, he, he was captured by terrorists and held and finally released. Some of you who were here today probably were on that trip with him because they all survived. Amazing stories he went through. He was a man of faith. Something else I want you to know that Jeff also was a man of great personal faith and sacrifice. And to give you a little example of that, I remember one time we were scheduled to go and do an evangelistic teaching in Peru at a conference. And I was going with him, and he was going through some very tough, uh, he had diverticulitis attacks from time to time. Very serious, if you know much about diverticulitis. And he had great pain. And if it was me, I'd say, cancel the trip, take me to the hospital. But he told me, Mike, just like the 10 lepers, as they went, he healed them. And so I'm going. And he went, and he did just fine. I'm thinking, you know, I would have blown the whole thing and thrown the thing under the carpet. Yeah, he went. He was always taking steps of faith, not just, you know, big things for the church, but in his own personal life. He trusted the Lord in so many ways. Something else I don't know if you're aware of, and, and I wondered if the girls were going to touch on it. I've never seen Jeff afraid or shaken and I've seen him through many crises and many threatening situations. I, I looked at him as unshakable. Matter of fact, when we go on a long trip together on an airplane, if the, we hit turbulence, I just thought, as long as I have Jeff with me, the plane's not going down. <laughs> and I'd say, I, I, I've, after I was on staff with Jeff for a couple of years, he invited me to start surfing with him. I, I'm a late bloomer. I started surfing at 34 years old. And I got my first couple of surfboards from Jeff, hand-me-downs. He charged me, but they were cheap. <laughs> and, and we had so many adventures, and I surfed with him weekly. I would, we both had Mondays off. So on Monday morning, I'd get up before the sun, and that's not like me, and I'd go down to Pastor Jeff's house, and I'd pick him up, and we'd load up the van, and we'd go surfing together every Monday for years, probably 13 to 15 years. I lose track. It was a lot of years of that, and over those, that time I saw I saw different sides of Jeff you never saw. And as a matter of fact, again, I saw how fearless he was. I mean, just a couple examples. One time, we were driving up and down PCH looking for where the waves are breaking, and we found this abandoned beach. Nobody was there, but the waves were breaking, so we parked, suited up, and walked out with our surfboards. And just before we hit the water, there's this big creature washed up on the land, and it looked like a mini whale or something, but it had a big bite taken out of its side. And we just stood, stood there holding our surfboards going, whoa, wow. I mean, I mean, it had to be a great white, big bite mark out of it. And we're just sitting there looking at it. And it wasn't long before Jeff goes, okay, you ready? You want to go out there? He says, oh, that's been here for a long time. I followed his lead, we paddled out and had a great day surfing. You know, I just felt like I'm with, I'm with Jeff, no, this is gonna be bad, <laughs> it can't happen, you know. Anyway, um, he was fearless, he was full of faith. And uh, another example that told me a lot about Pastor Jeff. One time we were on a trip to Peru and whenever we'd go on trips, if he could squeeze in a surf trip, he would. And so we're at Peru and uh, he planned a, a surf trip, and there was this place where the locals knew it was great, but it was tough to get out because the waves were breaking big, and the best way to get out there is to take the breakwater, and then as the tide raised and fell like that, uh, you have to take your board and jump in when it's high so you don't land on the rocks. One by one, they're taking their turns. Wait, time it. Jump, land, and paddle out before it goes back down and hit the rocks. Jeff was in front of me, and he slipped. 
and I saw him spin around. His board goes up in the air. His hands are straight out. And he's falling back head first into the rocks. If it was me, you would have seen a look of horror on my face and maybe even a little girl scream. <laughs> I'm looking at his face. It's like he's watching the Weather Channel. <laughs> there was not a bit of fear. I mean, he was just like, I guess I'm falling. <laughs> and of course, wouldn't you know it, he hit the water just at the right time, got on his board, paddled a lot. We had a great day of surfing. He just, that was life with Pastor Jeff. It was exciting. Um, now, he sometimes would it look like look for trouble because I remember some of you guys who've been with us as pastors for a long time, we'd have many pastors retreat. One pastor's camping trip we went on, he would, um, we would have this bear that kept roaming around and he would set old pieces of fish around because he wanted to get pictures of the bear. <laughs> the bear showed up and Jeff went to get pictures and the bear ran and Jeff chased it. It's like, Jeff, you don't chase bears. But he was the boss. Nobody tells him, no, don't chase bears. Uh, and and it's, it's funny, if you think that's not enough. One time, I went to Ethiopia with him. It was that same trip that Christy was talking about. We went to Ethiopia. I think it was the same trip. Because one night, we're in the, the hotel room, and Ethiopia hotels are not like ours. And in the middle of the night, where you're hearing this hideous sound. Like, <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't do that. But... You're hearing these strange, hideous, you, you can't sleep. And the next morning, Jeff asked the locals, what was that? It was the hyenas. The hyenas, they come out at night, and he goes, oh, where are they? I want to get pictures. <laughs> so they tell him, well, the hyenas, they, at night, they go to the dump and eat all the carcasses and the bones and the scraps. And it's at night, it's like Jeff wanted to go. So we get, yes, we're in this car. We drive up to the dump in Ethiopia in the middle of the night, and it was like a, a spooky movie because when the headlights went across, you see all these eyeballs. <laughs> Jeff gets out of the car get, with his camera. You're know, back in the day of film and roll, you know, and he's getting, we're all like yelling, Jeff, get back in the car. Hyenas, I don't know if you know, but their bite's worse than a lion's bite, you know? And, you know, me, I've got the window rolled up, taking pictures through the glass. <laughs> but that was life with Pastor Jeff. He got his pictures. Karen, I'm going to see the pictures if you could find them. He got his pictures, got back in the car, and we lived happily ever after, you know. He was a brave man, a man of faith. But you know what? He wasn't too proud to wash feet. I'll never forget the time when we were just starting out the uh, Mexico orphanage. And uh, a bunch of the pastors, we went down to Mexico and we we're going to have a work day and everything, they needed everything from a water well to things fixed. And a lot of the guys were handy. I wasn't. I would just do grunt work if I could. And we went down there to do a work week and I got as sick as a dog. And I, I, was, I wanted to go home. You know, Jeff's the one who pushed through it. I'm the one to take me home. And so uh, I'm feeling really sick, and there was a van leaving that afternoon to go home. And I said, Jeff, I want to go home. Could I go home? He, no, I want you to stay. Now, I didn't know. I thought he was mean. <laughs> but I didn't know what he had planned, you see. He talked me into staying, and he cooked me soup. He nurtured me. I'm sick. I don't, I'm a big crybaby. I, don't want, I want to go home. And he's, he's in the kitchen making me soup and cooking me a meal and taking care of me. Because later that night, I didn't realize, but it was important to Jeff. He was going to wash all the pastor's feet. And he, he, one by one, just washed our feet. That was Jeff. I mean, it was important to him. I was thinking, if you want to wash my feet, let me go home. <laughs> but it meant a lot to him. And I just, I wasn't seeing it. It's funny, as I'm writing my notes down afterwards, years later, I'm thinking, duh. That's, that's what he was thinking. Another thing about Pastor Jeff, a characteristic that many of you may not be aware of, is that he, was, he exhibited fierce loyalty. He was a loyal man, especially to his pastor, Chuck Smith. I mean, he loved Chuck. I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere on his body is a WWCD tattoo because he loved Chuck Smith. 
And whenever we'd have problems at the church or we wanted to try a new venture or do something, he'd always tell me, call Costa Mesa and find out how they're doing it. But I don't want to do it. Just find out what Chuck does. He followed Chuck's example to a T. He trusted Chuck. He loved Chuck. He wanted to know how Chuck handled things. And it's funny, I remember on the, on the more negative side, I remember one time all the big Calvary Chapel pastors, the ones who had big churches, were starting to get themselves some, a rather nice luxury car. You don't have to tell you the brand. But they all were getting these nice cars, and Jeff got one. And... Um, you know, it was kind of prestigious. And then the next pastor's meeting, Pastor Chuck, from the pulpit, kind of chided them. He says, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's a good witness for my pastors, the Calvary Chapel pastors, to drive luxury cars like that. Jeff got rid of his like that because he was fiercely loyal. He, he was a man of authority, a man of, of influence, but he was also was a man who knew how to submit. He was subordinate to Pastor Chuck Smith, and he, he listened to what Chuck had to say. All right, well, over the years, Pastor Jeff went through so many huge trials and challenges. I saw a lot that he went through, but he kept on trusting the Lord. Through It, it always amazed me there'd be a crisis going on, maybe in his family, maybe in the church, maybe in the staff, a layoff, a turnover, something horrible, and there's rumors and gossip, and I would think, Jeff, get up there on Sunday morning and set them straight. Tell them what's really happening because people are whispering. And Jeff would come to the pulpit, open his Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. He would just go right to the Bible. He never addressed all the gossip and all the garbage. He just said, let God defend you. And he would just teach the word. I, I love that about Jeff. That laid an example for me in my ministry and when I planted my own church to realize don't, deal with all the garbage, stay in the Word, teach the Word. And one of Jeff's famous, famous saying, I think uh, Jeffrey said it, is steady on. I, I'd go in sometimes and I'd want to know, okay, you just give, gave me missions or you just put me in charge of a So how do you want this run? What, what do you want done? And he'd say, steady on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to seek the Lord and see what God wants. But <clears throat> another saying that, <clears throat> another saying Pastor Jeff had, uh, he'd say, keep on keeping on. Have you heard him say that? Keep on keeping on. If you've ever worked in ministry with Pastor Jeff, you would hear that. And something that Tara touched on, and I think you should be really well aware of, is that uh, Jeff really believes in forgiveness and restoration. And over the years, I was on staff here. I, I served under Pastor Jeff for 30 years, but I was on staff for 20 years. And uh, over the, those years, I've seen some of his pastors fall into sin. And he really believed I'm going to do my best to nurture them and restore them and give them another chance. And I've seen him do that over the years, over and over again. He believed in God's forgiveness. He believed in restoration, and he practiced it. And when I moved to Idaho, you know, it was, it was tough. I mean, I, a lot of years and memories you're leaving behind. But um, I think I, we got even closer to Jeff and Karen after we moved away. It's easier to get close to your boss when you're not working for him anymore, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and as whenever there'd be a crisis, Jeff would hear about it and he'd call me. When my daughter died, he called me. Every time there's something wrong, hey, Mike, I couldn't talk. I'd be so emotional because I'm going through. I, this is your pastor. I want to pray for you. Over and over again, when I needed uplifting, he'd call me. He didn't have to. I, I live somewhere else now. I'm not working for him, but he'd call me and he'd pray for me. It, made, it meant a lot to me. <clears throat> and something else that came up as we were talking to Karen, as Jeff was in the hospital and we were reviewing things, and Karen said, you know, all those days in the hospital just holding Jeff's hand, examining his hand, I just saw all the scars of of construction and ministry, all the year, from the early years of digging ditches and construction. Jeff was a hard worker. He wasn't just a man, you know, in this ivory tower. He was a hardworking man, and you guys should know that about him as well. But most, most importantly, it's come out over and over again. He was a man of God's Word. He was a man who believed God's Word, lived God's Word, and taught God's Word. It was all about the Bible with Jeff, and it was all about Jesus. 
And some of you know that I kind of stole that from him. I, my motto has always been, it's all about Jesus. I think Jeff modeled that for me. <clears throat> so I served under Pastor Jeff. I served the Lord for 30 years, mixture of lay, as a lay person and a pastor. I personally traveled with him on many mission trips from Mexico, Peru, Philippines, Egypt, Rome. I had to write them down. I'd forget Ethiopia, Amsterdam, Israel, so much more. I'm not going to go through them all. But because of Pastor Jeff's ministry, it changed my life. I got to see the world. And so many missionaries, not just my experiences with or under Pastor Jeff's ministry, but so many missionaries were sent to so many places. The whole world has been changed by Pastor Jeff's ministry. And all the missionaries, you know, when you go on a trip, you get changed too. So many lives changed. So many people had so many marvelous ministry experiences because of Pastor Jeff. And I got to make a confession, though. Over the years I've worked with Pastor Jeff, I didn't always agree with him. I didn't always like his decision but I never doubted his sincerity, his authenticity, and his, his godly motives. He was, he was the real deal. And personally, since leaving Calvary Chapel Downey, I spent 20 years in Idaho, uh, both as an assistant pastor and 13 years pastoring my own church. But I've got to say, my most memorable, most impacting most unforgettable years of ministry were serving Jesus under Pastor Jeff's ministry, and I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I'm seeing a little flashing light that's saying time is up. <laughs> so let me just close with one. I'm going to cut some things. Let me just close with one little story. Over 20 years ago, it was right here in this stage. It was a different pulpit, but on this stage, Pastor Jeff laid hands on me and my family and prayed over us as he sent us off to Idaho. And as he finished praying, before I went back to the stage, if you know me, I'm like this, I grabbed Jeff and I kissed him. Now we're saying goodbye to Jeff. But let me just say this. We love you, Jeff. Eyes on him. Hi, I'm Don McClure, and I'm brokenhearted. I can't be with you today. Jeff and Karen have meant so much to me and my wife, Jean, and to, well, Calvary Chapel for so many, many years. I can't actually remember when I first met Jeff. I was on staff at Calvary and Costa Mesa when Jeff and Karen came along, not long after I came along. But something that maybe uh, some of you know or don't know, but that there was a group of people many, many years ago that Chuck Smith uh, came along and saw something in. What he saw in us, we have no idea. But as I reflect in thinking about Jeff, it reminds me of David when he came along and he's going to war. He's being chased. Saul wants him dead. And then David ends up, all that's around seemingly for him was a group of men, young men, we didn't know a lot about them initially, other they were in debt, they were distressed, they were discouraged, they were down and out. They didn't know what he saw any potential particularly in them, particularly, you know, somebody like David who is being hunted by 3,000 chosen men of Israel, all the crack forces of Israel, and here you've got a bunch of men that you would think, what is the potential of any of them? But David took them. And as David saw something in them, they were willing to fight. They didn't have all the equipment perhaps and the training that Saul's men had, but they had zeal and they had passion. They believed in something. And David seemed to see this in them. And David poured his heart and his life in the Psalms. He says, come my children, let me teach you the ways of the Lord. David trained them up. David disciplined them, discipled them, equipped them in so many ways that we weren't there to know, but we, he obviously did it because he ended up with what did uh, 2 Samuel, what is it, 22 or 23, David's mighty men. That these men changed the world and David saw something in them that he invested himself in. And that's what Chuck Smith did. A bunch of us that we came along many, many years ago, that we didn't see anything. We didn't, but Chuck saw zeal, he saw passion. He saw a desire uh, and, and, and he knew how to grab it. He knew how to encourage it. He knew how to look at something maybe they didn't see, but Chuck saw it. 
he, and, and he invested in it of his time and of his energy and his care and his leadership. And Chuck obviously left behind an incredible legacy all over the world. But then what happened is, is that then with David's mighty men, they end up, you know, leading great escapades and great battles. And that also was transferred over to the next generation, where now you could look and there's many that did not know Chuck, like, like those who were originally with him, who came along, you know, many, many years ago. But they knew Jeff. Oh, they knew Rawl. They knew Mike. They knew Joe. They knew, you know, things that, that, that uh, they knew them and on how, where I go all over the world, which I have so many places, and I'll find out people, oh, I came out of Downey. Jeff invested in me. Jeff, you know, helped us get going. Churches, ministries, all over. The mighty men were reproduced by the mighty men. And that's one of the wonderful things that when you look and see it go on, Sometimes the greatest test of a, greater, of a great leader is not what happened while he is alive, but what happens and what remains after he is gone. The Calvary chapels have grown over 50% since Chuck went home. And now you look at here, God has taken Jeff home. Such a dear friend, such a dear brother. And you look at the work, the ministry he did, and the legacy, it goes on. It's all over the world, it'll continue. There's many of you here today that you are here because of not Chuck, Oh, his grandpa may be to you, but your leader, the one who trusted and saw in you and invested in you, was Jeff. And as you think of him and to realize also your heart in your life, hopefully you're being encouraged, you're being equipped. You look at whether Chuck or now you look at Jeff and realize, Lord, now what about me? What about my life? Do I have that kind of vision, that kind of passion? I think that's something Jeff would want to make sure, not just remembering him, not just kind of looking at the exploits and the battles that he went through and the scars he survived and the ministry happened and what's produced and say, well, that's his legacy. That's not his legacy. His legacy, you know, you, you, Chuck's legacy was never brick and mortar. It wasn't a building. It, it, Chuck's legacy was people. And the same thing, Jeff's legacy is you and your life. And now to how hopefully there you look on and your blood system, your DNA, that Jeff gave you something that now lives within you and you can say, thank you, Lord. I thank you for Jeff, not just a kind man who preached well and did this, but Lord, more than that, what he put in my heart, what he put in my life that lives today, that's what I remember and that's what I now want in my heart and my life to carry on to another one. And so may God bless you today as you reflect and may it be a true, wonderful Memorial Day, remembering the Lord, remembering your DNA, remembering your family, remembering your call. So may God richly bless you today. How much we love Jeff and Karen. And as you pray for her and the staff here, I'm actually at the studios at Downey now and just looking around and realize it all continues. Yeah, so wonderfully, so beautifully. So may God bless you. And may you look there and say, thank you, Lord, for Calvary. Thank you for Chuck. Thank you for Jeff in his life. And so God bless you, strengthen you, and encourage you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon. How do you sum up a legacy in five minutes? Pastor Jeff's legacy was a lifelong, far-reaching, worldwide, impacting legacy. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the man that I got to know the last four years, uh, the man that I knew, the pastor, the spiritual father, the man that I loved. And when I think about legacy and I consider Pastor Jeff's life, I think that he had a legacy of faithfulness. He not only started well, but as you've heard by his daughters and granddaughters and other pastors, he also finished well. For over 50 years, the Lord used Pastor Jeff not only to plant, not only to build, but also to reap in ministry, not only a ministry that had a width, but a ministry that had depth. And it was that far-reaching love of God that Pastor Jeff had for people, that whether it was missions trips, whether it was pointing people and introducing them to Israel, whether it was outreaches here locally within the community, many people were saved and began a relationship with Jesus Christ because of the love that Pastor Jeff had for the Lord. His legacy is much like the legacy of Paul the Apostle. 
As Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, this, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to him who loved his appearing. We know that Pastor Jeff has received that crown of righteousness as he is with Jesus right now. He not only has passed, he not only has passed on what he had, but he has passed on who he is. He had a legacy of faithfulness, but also a legacy of love. You've heard many people today already be reminded of how much Pastor Jeff loved them. In his character, he was a kind man. He was so patient. He truly loved people and took time to talk to people. I know many of you have experienced the generosity of Pastor Jeff. Whether you came to church and you were a member of the body of Christ here at Calvary Chapel Downey or you were a pastor of your own fellowship, he always looked for ways as how he can help other people, how he can come alongside and support and raise someone else's arms up as well. He was so generous and he was full of grace even when others didn't deserve it, including myself. He was always willing to serve, always willing to give, and always willing to forgive. Pastor Jeff, in his faithfulness and his love, also was a man of true humility. If you knew him, you knew that he was truly humble. And as John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that Christ would increase, that was Pastor Jeff. He always wanted others to see Jesus and not himself. I remember many times spending time and praying with him, and as he prayed with the leadership here and the staff, he would say, uh, Lord, we get out of the way so that you can have your way. Pastor Jeff's calling and legacy resonates in his love for the teaching of the Word of God. He was committed to teach the Bible every time he would come up to the pulpit. He taught the Bible several times, cover to cover, every chapter and every verse. And if you sat in his studies, somehow, no matter where he was in the Bible, he ended with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was a man that was led by the Spirit. He was a man that was sensitive to the calling of the Spirit. He would never act out in anger. He was never impulsive. He never acted or made decisions in the flesh. He waited upon the Lord to tell him what to do. He was an example of a true shepherd in his legacy. But not only did he have a legacy of faithfulness to the Lord and to the church and to the ministry, he also had a legacy of love, but a legacy also of leadership. As you just heard right now, he was a man of faith and a vision. Pastor Jeff had a heart for that next generation. So much so that he started Bible schools here on campus of Calvary Chapel of Downey. And over 40 years ago, he and his wife Karen started a Calvary Chapel Christian School where different generations have gone through and been raised as disciples of Jesus Christ here, been t taught the word of God. Pastor Jeff was so bold, he had so much faith, that no matter what happened, he was always taking steps forward, and he was never taking steps backward. He took steps of faith not only with places, but as many of you are here, you realize he took steps of faith with people. He was a man that had faith, that he risked, and took risks on people as a man of leadership. He took a risk on many people that are here who have their own fellowships. And then he even took a risk with me. I'm so grateful that I got to spend the last few years of his ministry with him. And to be there by his bedside, to see him take his last breaths here on this side of heaven, knowing that he had finished his race well. When I think about legacy, I remember that when I met Pastor Jeff, he told me that it was so important for him that this church would continue beyond his lifetime. Yeah. Many people have asked me, you're that pastor that took over for Pastor Jeff. My answer has always been and always will be the same. I didn't take over for Pastor Jeff. I came to carry on the work that God did through Pastor Jeff. One of the greatest honors for me will always be to be called his successor, to be called as Joshua. I remember as he kept inviting me to come to teach at his church, and I had no idea why he kept calling. 
One day he called me and I was working at the bank and he said, all right, I'm coming to have lunch with you. And I said, that's great, but there's nothing open right now. You can't come. And he said, is there a break room at the bank? He said, yes, we'll eat the break room then. <laughs> and he came, he met my boss, he met my employees. He, sat, he looked at where I sat, he noticed my desk and he wanted to get to know who I was. Months later, he invited me out to lunch and he said he needed to talk to me. And I remember sitting with him in the front seat of his car and he said, all right, do you know why we're here today? And by that time, the Lord already had confirmed to my wife and I, and then to him. And I said, yes, I do. And he said, who told you? I said, the Lord. At that moment, he started to weep and so did I. Because we knew God had began something that it was of the spirit. Pastor Jeff had a commitment and his legacy, his heart was that this church didn't belong to him, but this church belonged to the Lord. And even while he transitioned to a different season of his life with his wife and his family, his greatest joy it was so important for him to be at church every Sunday. He would come and he would sit in the back pew and he would worship the Lord. He would bring his Bible he would receive. And many times after I finished teaching, I would go, I would give him an embrace. He would encourage me. And those times that I couldn't see him after service, I would call him Sunday evening. And I'd ask him, Pastor Jeff, what did you think of church today? I saw that you were there. And he would tell me, Art, that was the best service I've ever been to. <laughs> but he truly believed it. He was living in what God was doing today, not yesterday. And he was so grateful for what the Lord had done in this church. He would tell me, Art, I can't wait till I go into church one day. And there are people that don't know who I am. Because it's not about me, it's about Jesus. When I came on staff, and he was leading the staff, he gave me this gift, this Bible here. And this is the same type of Bible he would say that he used and that his pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, used. It's the same version, it's the same kind from the same publisher. And in it, he wrote this verse to me, 1 Peter 5, 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. He was a true shepherd. There are some men that I've learned how to be a good teacher. There are others that have taught me what it means to be a leader. But Pastor Jeff taught me what it meant to be a shepherd. He had a heart for people. He loved people. I remember we went to lunch one day, and we were talking about ministry, and I was expressing my gratitude to him. And I was telling him, Pastor Jeff, I am so thankful you didn't know me, and you've allowed me to serve with you at this capacity. Thank you so much for giving me the honor to be your successor. And he was quiet. He was listening. I probably talked more than I should have had that lunch. <laughs> but after I said everything I needed to say, he told me, "Or right, if you want to thank me, then just teach them the word. Because that was his heart, that the people here got fed the Bible, the word of God. He was a man of the word of God. You know, it's been said that legacy is not what people say when you're gone. It's what they do differently because they knew you. I pray that today, because you knew Pastor Jeff, you would act and you would do differently. That his legacy would live on more than just in your mind, more just in your heart, but in your actions. Steady on, eyes on him. God bless you. need to breathe. <laughs> For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm David. I'm the tour guide. <laughs> I'm the balagan. <laughs> and I think more than anything, I'm the souvenir that Jeff and Karen uh, brought back from the Holy Land. <laughs> Uh, which is why I'm here to make a few connections uh, about Pastor Jeff. Uh, we've all heard about what happened in the past. And, and again, I connected a little bit later. Um, I wasn't a part of the church. I wasn't a part of all these events. 
Uh, I do not know how to surf, and I've never seen him surf. <laughs> but I saw Jeff in Israel. And that's what I want to connect to you today. Though, before I go too far, I have to say something that I felt on my heart really important, and I think you're going to agree with me on this. Karen. Okay, I'll be talking about Jeff. <coughs> We've all been talking about Jeff. I'll be connecting all the different parts of his life. But I know you were there the whole way. And from me and from everybody here, I just want to say thank you. But God's put on my shoulders today to share one of Jeff and Karen's main passions, and that is the passion for Israel. Um, I was a tour guide, and uh, I met the Johnson family on one of the first tours because way back in the beginning, Jeff and Karen realized that if you're going to be part of this movement, if you're going to be a good shepherd, you're going to teach the word verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, you're going to support family, you're going to support life, and you're going to support Israel. And Jeff and Karen have been supporters of Israel from day one. There was another tour guide before me, and I came and I replaced them when he got a little bit too old and too gray. And uh, they brought me in to work with the seniors, especially. Uh, now I work with the older people because I'm too old and too gray. But... <laughs> I still remember the first time that I met a, a Calvary Chapel Downey senior group. And I, I want to share somebody who's not here today, but would have loved to be here today. And uh, I walk into the airport and I meet the bus driver. And uh, those of you who have been on a tour to Israel know what a bus driver is and how important this is. And this is the famous Avi Maletsky. And Maletsky looks at me and says, David, Another tour? And I said, yeah, well, we've got another tour. This is a pastor. And he says, no, no, David. He says, this is not just another pastor and his wife. I'm trying to do the Maletsky talk. I don't know if it's work. He says, these people, is the way he'd say, they love Israel very, very much. These people are not just people. They are mishpacha. Mishpacha means family. I'm standing here today because he was so right. Pastor Jeff and Karen Johnson are families of Israel. They're mishpacha of Israel. <laughs> Which is why... Um, since I'm in the family and I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, okay, what, what happens after? And, and Jeff and Karen hand it over to the flock to, <laughs> I'm going to say, a younger and more handsome shepherd that you saw here just a moment ago. And they had to decide what they were going to do with who and what. And all of this love for Israel that they've accumulated before. And, and it's my role to kind of introduce that to what's going forward. It's a ministry that Jeff and Karen are a part of and we're a part of now today that in, encapsulated, I think, the three things that, that made Jeff so important. His love for the Bible, his love for the church, and his love for Israel. And we were trying to figure out how to connect it all. And, and I think it was Jeff who said on, on the table in, in, in the house in Seal Beach, he said... Um, it's got to be something that is connected to Jerusalem. It's got to be something that gushes out from Jerusalem. It's got to be something that brings life to Jerusalem. And somebody said, wait a minute, the spring of Gihon, the spring of water that bubbles out from underneath Mount Moriah, the spring of water that is the main source of water for Jerusalem, the spring of water where the blind man was healed and opened up his eyes for the first time, is called the Gihon Springs. And then somebody else opens up a Bible. And if you got a Bible, you can connect this. Because 
the spring of Gihon, and we all un connect that to Jerusalem, but it turns out that there was another connection that I thought was fascinating. In Genesis 2, it says this, a river went out of Eden, as in the original Eden. It went out, it went to water the garden, and from there it parted up to four river heads. The name of the first river was Pishon, and it was where the gold was. And I'm going to call this the first river head. But the name of the second river was Gihon. Gihon Springs, out of Eden, is Jeff and Karen's second ministry, second journey, second place where they're going to show their dedication and their love for God. The ministry is dedicated to supporting Christians in Israel, which is why I'm here. It's dedicated to supporting believers in the very complex situation in Israel. We've been supporting ministries for young soldiers before they go into the army believing soldiers. We've been supporting ministries for uh, pro-life because abortion is a problem in Israel. We've been supporting ministries that create and print books of, I know this sounds familiar, of sound doctrine in Hebrew for the local believers. But here's the, the amazing thing, more than anything, right now, after the war, after everything that's been going on, after God's people, after this nation that Jeff and Karen loved is, is literally bleeding right now, now we're supporting the war effort. We're supporting families that actually have moved out of their homes in order to get away from the fighting. We're supporting the soldiers that are in Actually bringing out equipment, I mean, things like body army and, and, and knee pads and, and actually pizza too, to make them feel good. But we want to make sure that everybody here knows that the story of Jeff and Karen Johnson didn't end. It is continuing to gush out from the side of Jerusalem. It's continuing to gush out from this church. It's continuing to gush out to the rest of the world. So if you're interested in Gihon Springs, you want to connect, there's ways to connect to it there and, and way to talk. But I think as much as anybody, um, a ceremony for Jeff Johnson would not be full if you didn't hear some Hebrew. <coughs> so I'm going to try my best to do this. Um, this is the quote, the ironic blessing, and usually the priests say it to the people, but I think this time the people need to say this to Pastor Jeff. Jeff, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Jeff Johnson, may your, bless, may your, may your memory be blessed. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. like Rusty to go out this way. I mean, think about it, guys. I mean, there's no other better way he would want to go out than be with his grandsons, who he loves, and he wants to leave you guys with something, because he knew the Lord. He prayed. And Aaron, you, I mean, and that's something that's a challenge for you guys. It's right now. Uh, God is speaking through Rusty to all of us. Do you know him? Have you a relationship with him? Or are you struggling like he did for so many years? And, and, and it was so lost. And then finally, he said, there's somebody that died for me, who took it all from me to change my life. And that's what happened. So he's home in heaven. And Rusty... 
well done. You're a good, faithful servant. You fought the good fight. And you've gone to your eternal home. See, I, I don't know how many of you know that when you receive Christ, you're never going to die. <laughs> and it's just from this place to whoa. Now, hopefully you understand, whoa. If you don't, you got to look to the cross. Because there's your door. There's your way in. He did it all for you. And all you have to say is, Jesus, come into my heart. So, rest well, my brother. I will see you soon. Very soon. And we all will. Those of us who know him and have a relationship with him. So, I think this is what Rusty would want all of us to be confronted with. Don't, don't leave here without asking Jesus to forgive you of your sin, come into your life and change you, make you into a servant of God and, and into a, a righteous man and a righteous woman and, and be with you during these tough days. No, don't try to get through it yourself. You, you're not going to do it. He's there to help. He's there to take us to this journey that we're on. And then eventually, we're going home.
prepared so I can make sure I get through right this. First of all, on behalf of Karen and the family, I would like to thank all of you for coming to this memorial service to celebrate the life and ministry of our beloved friend and pastor, Jeff. Marie and I first came into contact with Jeff and Karen over 47 years ago when we began attending Calvary Downey. And as I've shared many times in the past, it was Jeff who dedicated my oldest daughter, Corinne, to the Lord. As with many children, Corinne went through a rough patch in her life that caused Marie and me to shed more than a few tears before she returned to her faith in Jesus. And I've blamed him for the trouble she caused us ever since. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding, but I wanted to share with you of her being dedicated by Jeff to give you a glimpse into how much we have loved Jeff and how much he has meant to us. Before we close in prayer, I would like to say something from the bottom of my heart. Jeff's life and ministry touched and will continue to touch multiple thousands of lives, including multitudes in various locations throughout this world. His life and his ministry also touched me. Over the years, I've had the opportunity of meeting and serving with many great pastors, and for that, I'll always be blessed. The simple truth is that among so many wonderful servants of God, Jeff will always stand out in my life as one of the most humble and welcoming men that I've ever met. He always made me feel welcome, and though he was a man who had great prestige in Calvary Chapel circles, he never made me feel like I didn't belong. His humble sense of simply being a servant made him stand out. And he was, in my eyes, a genuine model of what a pastor should be. And I'll miss him terribly. Over the last few years, we sat in many ministry meetings together. Often when I came into the room, Jeff would see me as I came in and, and would invite me to take a seat next to him. He never realized how deeply I appreciated him. He welcomed me into a circle of friendship. He'll never know until we see each other again how much such a small gesture meant to me. He's in heaven. He's enjoying the fruit of many years of faithful service. He's heard the well done, my faithful servant. He's fellowshipping with the Savior he loved so deeply, served so tirelessly. And like our Pastor Chuck, he served him faithfully even to his last breath. So this isn't goodbye. Because Christians never really have to say goodbye. This is Jeff. We'll see you later. Save a seat for me. So I can once again enjoy your fellowship as we serve the Lord forever together. Let us pray. Father, we bless you. We bless you for the hope of eternal life. We, we all celebrated just recently that hope that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who, who loved us and died on a cross for us. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. And because he lives, we live also. And Father, we thank you for the promises of life that we have that if we believe, we confess that eternal life is ours and it's a present condition that extends into eternity. And for this, we're grateful. 
I ask, Lord, for your comfort to be on, upon all who love Jeff and will miss him terribly. We especially take what Karen had to say in such a touching way, such an honest way. Don't forget me. Father, I pray that we won't. May she know how deeply we all love her too. And I ask that you'd be the comfort for the family. Thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. And thank you for the joy of salvation. And one day we'll have this amazing family reunion where we get to see Jeff and those we've loved and see our pastor Chuck and Kay. And, and Lord, we look forward to that day. But until that day, we roll up our sleeves. We continue working. The time is short. You're coming soon. Lord, may we take as many with us to heaven as we can. Give you praise for this now, Lord. We thank you for the service. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been, asked, I've been asked to dismiss you and to let you know that the family has supplied refreshments in the foyer. God bless you all. We love you. Thank you.